doing. It's a great pleasure to welcome now uh, to uh, the programme John Lloyd, who's a contributing editor to the Financial Times. And he wrote a piece uh, in the last few days which caught our eyes. No, Brexit, Britain doesn't want its empire back. A lot of people who've been engaging in Brit bashing have been basically saying that there's this nostalgic desire to go back to the days of rural Britannia amongst older people and that it's based on a false notion. Uh, John doesn't agree. Welcome to the programme, John. Thank you. Uh, Why did you write this article? Because the the view that, as you just said, that Britain is leaving the European Union uh, under the uh, under the shadow of um, an old view of empire and that uh, we're bigger than the European Union and that we're nostalgic for empire and want it back, I think is wholly false. A number of people are saying that, including people in Ireland as well as in the UK and elsewhere. And I think it's a, a kind of a, it's a habit that's become ingrained uh, and it's blamed upon those who are the Brexiteers, most of whom are working lower middle class most of whom have no knowledge of or experience of empire and want it for quite different reasons. And why, what do you, if it's not that, what do you think uh, is driving Brexit? What comes over again and again when people are asked this is that the the phrase which was popularised during the campaign is we want to take back control. Part of that is about immigration. But part of it, and probably the most of it, is about getting back to a politics which is comprehensible and which you know, and which you ha- have had in your blood, as it were, for some time. And that is national government. That's government from Westminster. And the, the fact that the European Union, for all of its, its many advantages, is incomprehensible to most people as, a, as part of government, and it is now part of government for uh, 28 countries in Europe, means that the the people above all the people of England, but the people of Britain as a whole, now wish to return to something which is comprehensible. And that but is but, but on, on a day-to-day basis of ordinary people's lives, how does Brussels rule make your life so uh, intolerable? It doesn't certainly doesn't make things intolerable. Indeed, in many ways, it makes things better. Uh, many of the, the, the laws and regulations passed by the European Union have made things better in all kinds of ways, in work, in, in the environment, in food and so on. The problem is not that. The problem is to have a, uh, a sense that your vote counts. Even if you're voting, uh, if you've got one vote among millions, it nevertheless counts. It doesn't count in, in the European Union. The European Union has had one party for the last several decades, and that party has essentially been more Europe, a more integrated Europe, and ever closer union. But, but, uh, no, but, but that. John, in fairness, we have lots of issues in Ireland where we would agree with the Brits and we wouldn't agree with Brussels, like tax harmonisation to retain a veto over to ha- have whatever corporate taxes we like. There's lots of things that we've decided, issues of marriage equality, abortion and so on, which were entirely down to us. On a d- weekly basis, our parliament passes various laws. I mean, is this not a myth that's been peddled, that certain things have been harmonised? But really, it's all about a block of five, six hundred million people who, in a globalised economy, can trade with each other, and it's a win-some game in terms of wealth. And where Britain has made a huge mistake and is is maybe indulging in self-harm is they think, as a country of sixty million people, it can cut deals with trading blocks in the world that are better than the fifty trade agreements that Europe has. Well, that still has to be has to be tested, and it may not be the case. I'm not arguing that Brexit uh, is going to be easy. Indeed, I voted Remain because I assumed, without enthusiasm, but I voted Remain because I assumed that something like this, which is happening, is happening, and it will be bad, at least in the short term, for the economy. The problem is not that. My piece was directed at those who regard Britain as now, or the, at, least, at least the English, or a majority of the English, as looking backward, as if through a, a, a rear-view mirror, at an empire where Britain was world top dog and want to go back to that. There is almost no one, certainly I think no one in any position of authority, who, who actually believes that is possible. You get all kinds of 
nostalgia coming up, both from politicians, from journalists, from, from other people as well. But it means little. Britain has, over the last 70 years, set itself of empire, has adjusted to being a middle-ranking power, a middle-ranking European power. We are European. But, but has balked, and has balked really from the beginning, and has now voted, the people have voted, against being a member of the European Union, a European Union which, incidentally now, uh, as you will know, still being, being very much part of it, is becoming more divided, weaker, and less, less attracted by ever closer union. And, and do you think if there was another vote that people would vote the same way? It's a good question, and I don't know. Uh, it may well be, because... Now people are realizing the difficulty of coming out of the European Union, that there would be a narrow majority for Remain. My point on that is that this has happened too often before, that a country has voted, including Ireland, has voted one way and has been told then that they made a mistake and must vote another way. And I think that the majority, a narrow majority to be sure, but the majority that voted in 2016 to come out of the European Union would be hugely annoyed to the point where society might begin here and there to break down if they were then told by who, people whom they assume rightly are the establishment, you've got it wrong, vote again until you get it right. It's a pity the vote went that way because actually Britain was in a good position in, our, in, in the European Union. It was, it was out of Schengen, it was out of the euro, uh, and but it had all the advantages of the trading bloc. Nevertheless, that has been the vote, and I think democracy would be very badly served, would be dangerously compromised if we went back and asked people to vote again. And and a lot of the Brexiteers blame Ireland's position uh, and sort of stubborn resistance on the backstop and the border question and not having a hard border as kind of meaning that, 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 that Britain is handcuffed to the EU and will never get out of this wretched uh, institution. Uh, what impact do you think these current convulsions are having on Anglo-Irish relations amongst ordinary people in their view of the Irish? Well, it's a, another good question. I, I, mean, I heard people who were interviewed just before we began this conversation, one saying that it would be one woman who's worked, who is Irish and but worked in London for much of her working life, saying it would be a return to the pre-agreement, the pre-Belfast agreement period. And that would be terrible. Uh, I doubt it would. Uh, I think for one reason that the, uh, the, the provisional IRA have more or less given up now. Uh, they've gone over to the the political struggle rather than the armed struggle. And I doubt very much if any more than a few extremists would take up the gun again. Secondly, it does seem to me that we are, and have been for many, many a year, we, the Irish Republic and the UK, are so interlinked. Indeed, the woman who's Irish who's working in London is one of thousands, hundreds of thousands. There are many Brits working in the Republic of Ireland. We're just too close. We have, especially the Irish, have bad memories of a British empire which ruled them and, was, and, uh, uh, and discriminated against the Catholic majority. The, the history of British-Irish relations is a drear one. But what's happened in the last two or three decades has meant that the suspicions and the distance have been greatly narrowed. And I doubt, I doubt if it would go back to the kind of suspicions we had before. There's been a number of texts. John is absolutely right. I'm a British living over here. Jack says, why can't you understand, that's me, that the British want to make their vote count? You Irish were made to vote twice, as your first vote disgracefully didn't count the first time. You have no backbone. But Chris says... Ivan, having watched and listened to endless UK public debates on Brexit, it's clear that hard Brexiteers are disconnected with the reality of modern international manufacturing supply chains, the delicate peace process in Northern Ireland, the benefits of EU membership confers. The reality is they'll never believe or understand the economic harm and damage Brexit will do to their union until they leave and reality bites. Could I put it to you that a hidden 
unintended consequence of this is that it may result in the breakup of the uni- Union of the United Kingdom. It's quite clear if you listen to SNP and a majority of politicians, not the DUP in Northern Ireland, that a wedge has been driven between what you described as English people, English nationalists, English patriots, and other uh, nationalities in the Union of the UK. Well, speaking as a Scotsman, although a unionist Scotsman rather than a nationalist one, uh, the wedge really has been driven by the Scottish National Party, not so much by the English. The English have reacted, actually, with a large delay to the uh, SNP, which has taunted them for the last 10 to 20 years, and also to the fact that Scotland, with Northern Ireland for that matter, gets a much more generous settlement of public expenditure than does England. These things which were put up with for the first few years of a separate Scots Parliament now have come home to roost and it may well be, indeed there are now plans of foot and uh, proposals being tabled in the House of Lords for an English Parliament so that England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland would each have an assembly, would each have, if you like, a separate national existence under a federal government which would be much smaller. It's uh, an audacious idea because, as you know, England is 55 million people, Scotland five, Wales two and a half, Northern Ireland less than two million. So you have an elephant in the room surrounded by, if I can mix my metaphors, pygmies in a, in a population sense. So it would be difficult, but I think it's now a possibility. Whether or not that will then mean that Scotland will go independent, again, I kind of doubt A third of Scots actually voted for Brexit, of course a minority, but but nevertheless a large number, including very many people who are nationalist voters. And secondly, Scotland, rather like like the Republic, have to think of what the uh, disadvantages of a hard border would be if they were to join the EU and the rest of the UK wouldn't. 60-65% of Scots exports go to England. And that... Uh, that, I think, is giving the leadership of the Scottish National Party pause before they do anything rash like another independence referendum. Okay, John Lloyd, contributing editor at the Financial Times. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. 